the new way everyone is getting their cell service. No overage penalties, great rates, keep what you do not use, no contracts, and someone will actually pick up the phone when you need support. Use our link and get $25 off your first month's service or your new phone. Just go to tech-zen.tv slash ting to save $25. Welcome to episode 17 of Let's Make It. And this week we are going to cover a subject that was given to me by one of our, our viewers. And actually we're going to actually see some of his code tonight. And uh, thank you, Bob Powell, uh, for all the time you've put into this. I uh, definitely appreciate that. And uh, we're going to be talking about this for the next couple of weeks in different variations of it. And as I mentioned last week, we're going to talk about shift registers. And let me first explain one of the advantages to using a shift register. Uh, the Arduino, and this kind of goes back, if you remember back when we did the LCD, the serial LCD, we took uh, 12 pins for an LCD down to four, and we saved a lot of pins. So well, that's what we do, same thing with a shift register. And the one we're going to look at tonight is an 8-bit shift register, which means it can control eight outputs. Uh, we're going to use LEDs to demonstrate uh, that what's coming on or off, but you could attach a relay to it or any other device that can use uh, low voltage to contact closure type of stuff as well. Now, um, to control this, we basically are only using three wires. And uh, you can actually attach more wires to it for a little bit more control, but for most applications, the three wires is going to be enough, and that is data, and that is clock, and that is uh, basically an enable. Um, and it was basically you take, let's say they call it a latch, and when you take the latch to uh, high, you send your data and using the clock in the data pin, and you take your latch back low again, and depending on what data you sent, depends on which pins come on. Now, this is where we get into a little bit of the binary, uh, and if you're not familiar with binary, we're not really going to teach that, but I definitely go to Wikipedia and learn a little bit about binary, and uh, binary basically is math done in base two. We think of base, uh, base 10 math all the time, uh, but base two basically is a zero or a one, and based on eight zeros or ones, you can go from zero to 255, zero being all pins off, 255 being all pins on. Now, fortunately for you, the computer, the Arduino, can do that math for you as well, but you've got to understand what you want for which pins, and after you figure it out, it doesn't take too long. And there's a couple of patterns you do. Basically, you give a number, uh, you give numbers one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128, and those are the different pin values. So you figure out what pins you want on, you add them all up, send that number to the shift register, and it turns on the right pins. So uh, I know this is gonna be confusing, so there's gonna be a lot of uh, show notes for this one, uh, just some schematics, because when I show you the Arduino, it looks like very colorful spaghetti. So let's go take a look at what we have on the breadboard this week. Okay, so here's what we have for the breadboard this week. And like I said, very colorful spaghetti, and it looks like an absolute mess. And I understand that. So uh, let's very quickly kind of go through this, and the, the schematic will make it a lot make a lot more sense when you see it. Uh, just the way the breadboard is with all of its wires and everything, it's a little messy. So we have green for our ground, and we have red for our five volts, and they're going to the buses over here. And you'll see at the top, I'm actually making the buses over here also uh, ground in five volts, just so I'm kind of both sides of the pins need to be used. In the, between all the wires, right down inside of here, is our chip, and we're actually using a TPIC 6B595 shift register. I'm gonna go through the data sheet with you here in a couple of minutes to show you what it does. Uh, but off of that, we have three pins coming over. So we have our latch, our data, and our clock right here. And it's, we have it set up as pins uh, eight, 11, and 12. And they're going to the power pins over here. Now the rest of the spaghetti, you'll see right here some resistors. You can barely see them. In fact, I ordered some colored ones so you can actually see what they are. But there's LEDs in here and they're blue and they're very bright blue, unfortunately. Uh, as you'll see when we turn this on, the camera just basically dims everything else out. But you can at least see what it's doing. And then we have wires running from each positive or a negative side of the LEDs to the chip up here. And the positive side has a resistor in there so we don't blow out the LED. And basically the um, shift register acts as a drain. So whenever the drain turns on, it allows electricity to flow uh, back to ground. And actually on the chip itself, there's three grounds. And the reason for that is the five volts and the top ground or the logic level 
control. And the two grounds on pins uh, 10 and 11 are the drain pins. So whenever a pin is in drain mode, basically electricity flows back into this and goes out pins 11 or, um, so sorry, 10 or 11, depending on which side of the chip the um, pin is on that it's draining from. So um, that is, it looks like a lot of spaghetti. Like I said, you got wires going to each LED. So there's eight of those w colorful wires are going to there. Uh, we have three grounds coming from the chip in one five volt. And then we also have three pins coming over to the Arduino. And then we have the crossover. So it's, it looks like a lot of spaghetti code, uh, but the, the uh, schematic will make it a lot more sense to you. So let's go look at the actual data sheet for the, the, ch uh, the chip. And like I said, this is a TPIC 6B595 shift register. And you can see right here the pins, and we have the first two pins, pins 1 and 20, are not connected. Then we have our VCC with our 5 volts, and our pin 19 is our ground. This is the voltage that is used by the chip itself for its logic. Then we have uh, zero in and zero out. We're going to talk about zero out in a little bit. We're not going to demonstrate it this week. And like I said, this is a first week of a couple of weeks with different kinds of shift registers. So then we have drains zero through three on this side of the chip, and those are the pins that are going to the LED. So these four right here and the drains four through seven on this side are controlled by our logic that we send out. And then we have SR, CLR, and G. And basically what they are is, um, it's going to we'll actually read how it reads it because it's a little bit complicated uh, when you um, when G is held high basically it's in the enable pin so we we basically have hardwired G to high and we hardwired SRCLR to low because when it's low it allows output to happen that's kind of like the enable pin in a way and then uh, we do our bottom two pins here are ground these are the two grounds that are for the drains and then here we get to our clocking so that we have and the uh, latching pins. So RCK is the equivalent of a latch pin, and SRCK is the clock pin. So we'll get into a little bit more of the logic when I scroll down here, and you'll see how this all kind of works. And then we go back up here, and we still have our, our drains on the other side. So that's going down here, and we're going to go look at the, the actual, well, here's the circuit. It's in the data sheet as well, but what I want to get to is the timing, which shows you how all this works together. So I'm going to scroll down here past all this voltage stuff. All right, so here are the pins that we have. So you see uh, G has to be high, uh, and we've actually tied it high. It's, it's always high in our case. Uh, and then we also um, tied SRCLR to, uh, to low. And here's our clock, and here's our data, and this is our latch. So. You can see as we take the latch low, so that basically it's accepting data, we then send out clocking, and however many bits we want to send, in this case it's eight, eight bits, and we send out our data. So right here you see it's sending uh, two ones, two zeros, two ones, and two zeros. So that'd be, you know, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. That's how the, uh, the LEDs would uh, be, be lit. And over here's a very simple uh, block diagram. Actually makes a lot more sense than all the pins at the top. And we will also put all this in the notes, how this is all working as well in the uh, show notes and in the notes for the actual program itself. But here you again, you see in, uh, what pin numbers they are. So you see pin three is serial in, and then you have your, um, your latch and you have your clock. And then these are the um, enable pins. All right, so um, what I wanna do next is I wanna show you what the program, I'm gonna put a program on here and I'm go load it, make sure I have the right one, because I don't think that I do. Uh, in fact, I know I don't, I see which one it is. And, oops, wrong one. Let me plug in the Arduino, and I had it unplugged because it was so bright. And I want to let it boot for a second. Okay, now I'm going to upload. Okay, so here we go, and we're gonna walk through this one finally. I think I got it all figured out what I did wrong there. So what you see the Arduino doing now is, uh, you see the LEDs lighting up, and if you know binary, you know what it's doing right now. It's like basically counting up from one to 55, and just gonna keep on going until it gets to 55, then I'll go back to zero, which means all lights off. 
So um, it's going to continuously do this. And we, I did this just for a simple reason, uh, to demonstrate in code how you send out values to control LEDs. Now we have eight LEDs and it's eight bits, so it's zero to 255. And it's done by twos. So um, again, it's best to go out and look, look at Wikipedia is a really great article on uh, binaries and how you can calculate binary. But basically, uh, if you look at it from the LED point of view, the first LED is worth one, the next LED is worth two, the next LED is worth four, the next LED is worth eight, the next LED is worth 16, next one's worth, worth 32, next one's worth 64, and we stop at eight, so our next one's worth 128. So if you would take all the lights that are on and add it up, that would be the number that it's sending out right now through the shift register. So let's go look at the code. And this is actually fairly simple um, to do. And because the Arduino can already do this uh, kind of built in, it has the logic to be able to do this. So uh, this is my program. And I'm sorry, it's not commented yet. I will comment it before I get it up on the show notes tonight. But we have uh, three pins. We have our latch pin, our clock pin, and our data pin. And um, the latch pin is, in our case, pin 8. Our clock pin is pin 12. And our data is on pin number 11. And so we get down into setup. Basically, all we need to do in setup is set these three pins to output, because these are always going to be output. And then we come down to our loop. And we are going to display from 0 to 255. I notice it's 256. What well, that means, it's less than 256, which is 255. So when it gets to 256, it basically um, drops out and goes back through the loop one more time. So it sits in this for loop uh, and goes around from 0 to 255 and then drops out and comes back around into the loop routine again. So it's going to sit here and do this forever in the loop. So what we first thing we do is we take latch pin low because we can't write data until latch pin is low. So we take it low and then we do a built-in function of the Arduino called shift out. And we give it what our data and clock pin is and we want most significant bit first. Um, this is the way that most, well, no, it's not necessarily true. I was gonna say the way most computers work, actually it's LSB first, uh, but it's just, this is the direction. So the uh, least significant bit being number one um, would be LSB first, it would be on the right. And then if it's uh, MSB first, it's reversed to that. So we're sending it out as most significant bit first. And then we send out the number. So we go around the first time, we're sending out zero, which means no pins come on. We go through, we um, send out the data, oh, set latch pin low, send out the data, set latch pin high, and we delay 10 milliseconds, and we're writing latch pin back low again. I don't know why we're doing that. Actually, I don't think we need to do that. We're going to do uh, an experiment live as we do this. This is part of the fun of the show. I didn't think we needed to do that. I don't know why that was in there. I think that was something Charles was experimenting with, but it's working fine without that. So we're going to cut, take it out. I think that's a mistake from me experimenting with a different chip before tonight. All right. So after we set our latch pin back high, so the pin basically, the chip will basically say, okay, I can output again and we'll output whatever we sent out through the shift out. We delay half a second and we come back and we do it again. So we come back and do it again. We set latch pin low. This time we're equal to one. So we're sending out through the data pin and clock pin with MSB first number one. So the first LED will come on and we're going to set, uh, well, actually it doesn't come on. So you set it back to high. So uh, it's set to one. We set it back to high. The LED comes on. We wait half a second and we go back and we do it again. And we go to two and we go to three. And we go to 255. So that's why when you look at the actual Arduino, you see it's counting. So uh, let me do this. I'm going to restart the Arduino and it's going to start back with one LED. So let me go do that. I'm just going to unplug it and plug it back in again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So you see it's counting up the, up the line. So that's how easy it is to do a shift. Now, that's the reason it's so easy in the Arduino is because there's a built-in function in the Arduino called shift out, which practically does all of the work for you. Um, and there's not necessarily a baud rate. So I've been asked the question before of what is the baud rate. Well, it's as fast as the Arduino can put it out because it's using its own clock. Um, I don't know what the effective baud rate really is. I haven't had a chance to measure it. I don't really know how I would measure that other than uh, for the period of time that the latch pin 
is low, how many bits and how, well, I guess I could measure the latch pin low and high because I would take, you know, in between the two points would tell you what the, um, the baud rate is, but I haven't done that. Uh, it'd be a good experiment. I might try that at some point and try to get the effective uh, baud rate, but it's fast. So that's all that's important. Um, and it's, it's actually very fast. So there's nothing you have to really, really worry about. But basically what you're doing is you're doing a serial interface through uh, three pins. So you used up only three pins. Wow, do I have something to tell you about today, man? Wow. I mean, you've got, you get tired of your cell phone service, you know, I mean, I just had a, an overage. I mean, it was horrible because I went and got I went my data coverage. I went over to my data coverage. And, man, it was just beat me up over that. But I have some good news today. I want to tell you about Ting. Ting is the new way of doing cell phone service. And it comes from, from somebody who's very familiar to almost everybody. You've almost all heard of Two Cows, and that is who he runs Ting. And, uh, they, man, they got some great rates. I mean, if you look at the plans, and uh, they're uh, a use-what-you-pay-for-what-you-use type of service where if you don't use the $500, 500 minutes a month that you paid for, $9 for, and you've only used 100 minutes of it, they will drop you down to the next level, which is $3 for the 100 minutes. Have you, would your cell phone service actually take and drop your rate because you didn't use all the minutes that you bought? No. This is the first company I've ever heard. It's a whole new way of doing business. And let's look here. Let's look at some of these rates. 500 minutes a month. If you're using 500 minutes a month, it's $9. So I don't even use close to 500 minutes a month. So I'd be $9 for the phone service. I don't do that many text messages. Uh, let's say I'd be at most 100. So that's $3 a month. And let's say I do a gigabyte a month in data. So that's $24. So my total bill through Ting is $42 a month. And if I don't use that much data, it will drop the price. And if I use more, it just brings the price up to the next tier. It's all completely automatic, which is awesome. No company has ever done this before that I've ever heard of. Uh, they always want to take your money and, and charge you overage fees. And if you do go over, there's no fee. You just, char you just pay for the extra usage that you use for that month. There's no fine for going over and using the service. It doesn't make any sense to be able to, to, be able to fine you for that. So, yeah, they have great rates. Um, plans starting as low as $9 a month, and I mean really $9 a month. That's for 100 minutes a month. So you could get the cheap phone for your kids for emergencies or for your grandparents or whatever. No overage plans. Like I said, there is no more fear. There's no anger and there's no suspicion to worry about. You're going to go over that made-up limit that your current provider has given you. And then and when you know you've gone over it, you wait for that heavy bill to come every month, and you know, you're holding it like it's a bomb getting ready to go off before you open it up. And if you don't use it all, like I said, you get credit back. You don't use what you thought you would, they'll give you, they'll drop you down the next tier, and you don't, won't pay that much uh, for that month. And that's revolutionary. There's no carrier I've ever heard of that's done this before. It's awesome. You can put multiple devices on one plan. I mean, how many plans did your family have? Most families have two to three plans, cell phone plans, and they're not like a family plan. With Ting, it's real easy. You add a phone, you just pop it on the plan, and it comes right up. Uh, and it starts working right away. And you can actually go out into the dashboard and understand how you, your family is using the da using the service, too. Are they getting close to going over the minutes? Do you want to get a uh, better price for your minutes, go up in the next tier? Uh, do you want to drop certain things down? You know, you can watch how everything's going in nice, easy-to-understand graphs right on the, right on the dashboard. It's great. Uh, there is, like I said, there's no fees or limits on usage. So let's say uh, you have a carrier and you have unlimited minutes, and now you've gone over the two gigabyte limit and they're going to start speed slowing you down you don't have to worry about that here there is none of that here ting allows you to use all that you want there is no limitations and no additional fees uh for that tons of free features too i mean it does not make any sense these other carriers are charging you for your data then they want to charge you to, to tether your phone why it's your data you're going to use it after all right so it doesn't make sense with ting there is no additional charges there's free tethering free hotspotting free number porting in either direction, in or out. If you want to leave Ting, they'll, they'll gladly help you get to the carrier you want to go to, free picture and video messaging, all those normal call services, call forwarding, call waiting, voicemail, all that's included in Ting. And get this, there is no contracts. What would you do if you left your current carrier right now? Are you under contract? Would you have to pay a penalty to get out? With Ting, there are no contracts. So you can cancel at any time without any penalty. You can bring your own device or buy one from Ting. They'll work with you however. They're very flexible. You do whatever you want. No problem. And think about this. I mentioned before about the $9 a month. Think about strategically used devices. For example, 
your mother who doesn't normally use a cell phone and getting up there in years, you want to stick one in a glove box in case she breaks down somewhere. Nine bucks a month. That is great insurance for having your family be able to get in touch. And that's 100 minutes a month. I mean, if, if you don't use the 100 minutes, it's even less than it because down to zero. So if it's not used, I mean, it's a great way to keep a device around that is easily usable. So, yeah, it's it's great. Um, they bring uh, you can bring your own device, like I said, and they have great devices to buy. They have a, they have a lot of devices. Let's go take a look what we have for for the devices. You'll see very modern devices, lots of Android out here. There's a Samsung, LG, all the big names are out here. There's more Samsung. There's a, there's a Samsung X3, the most popular Android phone in the market. And you can get the S3 in multiple colors and multiple sizes right here in Ting. And you buy the phone, and it's your phone. There is no contract to worry about. And for those strategic phones that like I was talking about, here are phones that are really cheap Samsung phones um, that you can use in the glove box for emergencies. Just keep them charged there once in a while. And, I mean, they're really inexpensive. And you can also get your uh, wireless devices for data as well, right from Ting, Ting directly. So there's also, they have something else that I've never heard of before, and it's the no hold customer support. Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., there is no hold, they turn hold off. So you when you call, it rings until somebody picks it up. There is no going into the queue or anything like that. And they pick it up fast too. And their their support staff they're empowered. They don't have to go to their supervisor to get things. They give you the real name. None of these made up names. They actually all post in their pictures and everything, and they and they post the blogs. Um, they're kind of the way they describe themselves is like you have that person in your family who comes and fixes your computer, your nephew or whatever. They hire people like that that already know how to use the phones. And they just train them on the Ting way. It's awesome. They, I mean, they're already up to speed, super smart. And no hold. There is none of this waiting in the queues and pressing numbers, and it's just immediately ready to a person. They're, and they're all empowered to fix your issue. Uh, there's those clear, easy to read graphs on the usage on the page, easy to understand bills, cancel anytime. And as you saw on the phones, they are very Android family friendly. The you know the operating system that's the most popular operating system right now in the world, Android, and they embrace Android. And their coverage is awesome. You should go to their site and check out their coverage and see what you can get. They use other major carriers to um, provide the service. So it's not like they're building out their own network. They are already there. There's nothing new to build out. They probably cover you everywhere you go right now. And I definitely recommend you go out and check them out. Now, we have a special offer for you from Ting, from TechZen.TV. You can get $25 off your first bill or $25 off your phone if you buy the phone from Ting. And the way you get that is you go to tech-zen.tv slash Ting, and you'll go right to the special page just for us and get $25 off of your first bill or the first or the device that you buy. And uh, that's all just for listening to us. So, and that was something, I appreciate Ting supporting us here. And I definitely recommend you go check them out. This is the way of the future the new way to do cell phone service. Now, um, I'm using a different chip than what Bob did in his in his program, but they, this is like a standard. So um, I actually have his program on here, and I'm going to load it. And he's done all kinds of neat things that it can do, and we'll walk through his program as well. And um, I haven't asked him for permission to give you his information about where you can download it, but he does have it out there. It can be downloaded. And if it's okay, I'll stick that on the show notes as well. And you can download this program that I'm getting ready to run. So let me go upload his program uh, really quick. And let's go watch what it does. All right, here's his program. So you'll see it's flashing. And then he's calling that meter, and he's going in different directions. So it's like a, like an, a UV meter up and down. Uh, there he's flashing every other. You can't hardly tell that on the on the camera though. And then that's a marquee. Uh, I think that I forget what he calls that, but it's like a uh, pass or something like that. Let me go here and look real quick. Chris, he calls that a crisscross. These are all these are random right here.
I think that's the Knight Rider effect, <laughs> as he calls it in his code. And now he's counting. You see he's counting a lot faster than what mine was. And I think now we're off and we're going to go, you know, kind of in the other direction now. Definitely counts a lot faster than what mine was. And now it's counting down. So you see it's a really good example of different things you can do with it. And uh, we can walk through the code here in a second and look at it. It should go all on, then all off, and then it starts over again. Yep, there's a spectrum meter. Okay, so let's go walk through this code. And let's go back up to the top. And he's very good at documenting. I need to take some lessons from him. So going on down here. Okay, so um, I had to change, anything I had to change to get his program to work with mine was I had to use different pins than the one he had used. And I just changed my latch pin, clock pin, and data pin to the same pins I used for the other project. And you can see he's actually um, written it with using a different chip than me, but because they're all work very similar, um, with it, this works. So let's see, going down. So we have eight LEDs. So he's using this as his array. He's using an, an eight, uh, eight position array to keep track of what lights go on. So you see here he, he's de defining it. And then he has constants and that is, um, Zero is all off. And now here's something we haven't talked about before. And this is a shift. So basically it's the number of LEDs shifted to the left eight times, minus one, which makes it 255. And then he has odd, odd and even LEDs. He sets them to zero. He does use this later on in some of his calculations. So he comes down into the setup function and you can see his setup is very similar to what mine was. He did it at a function here called all off, just in case they were on initializes his array and then he also sets up his odd and even LEDs. Now here you say you see he's shifting again and this is how he's setting the odd and the even LEDs. He does it right here as well. And again this is shifting so we should probably cover shifting here sometime soon so that you understand exactly um, what it's doing. And then we do he does a random C. This is part of his random algorithm later on for his his uh, random LEDs, and that's the end of his setup. So in his loop, he comes down and he does a function call to flash all. We're gonna walk through his function calls here in a little bit. Uh, flash all, 1,000, and, and then two, and if I remember correctly, that's the delay in number of times. And then he waits one second. He goes into his uh, meter effect, and he basically generates a bunch of random numbers six times in a row and sends it out to this per, uh, function called meter. Uh, and we will go look at what the meter does. It's something he created as well. And then he waits uh, one second and comes back and he does the meter effect in reverse. So he does it in, uh, you see this true and false? That's actually his direction, I believe, if I remember correctly, I think through his routines earlier. He waits two seconds and then he flashes um, odd and then even. So he flashes the odds for three times and the evens for three times the 250 millisecond delay. And that flash is also another routine he created. And part of the reason you can see that is you see delay is the different color. Uh, flash is something that the user created. Delay is a, uh, a function that's built into the Arduino language. That's how you can tell the difference. Then he does the marquee effect. And when that's another routine of his, we'll go down, we'll walk through that. Then he does the crisscross effect, waits two seconds, randomly turns on and off the leads. 
then does a chase effect. And again, another function we'll walk through is chase down here. And he does it actually does it twice. He does it all, oh, he does it in reverse. He does chase in reverse as well. And then he does the Knight Rider effect. He does the flash again. Uh, flash all. And then he does the count up. He does the odd and even flash. And then does the count down. And then he does the all on, all off at the end. All right, so now we're getting down to the functions that he created. And here's flash all. It flashes all leads, and it takes in the duration and the count. So flash all basically is calling another he called flash, uh, and it's calling it with all on, which is we defined at the top as being in this case 255 or 256 minus one. And yeah, we can done the actual flash routine. So it flashes LEDs, uh, number of number to be flashed how long the LED is on and how many times to flash it. So here you see, first thing he does, he turns everything off. Then he comes in and he goes through the count, which we passed in how many times. He writes out the number to turn on. He waits this many uh, milliseconds or you know, it's milliseconds he's passing in. And then he sends out the all off, writes out bits for all off. Then he does the delay again that we, we sent in, and he goes to that loop as many times as you tell him to in the count variable that you passed in. So that's his flash. And this is crisscross, and we saw in crisscross, he started at the ends and went into the middle and came back out again. So first thing he does is he clears his array, and he turns everything off just to make sure he knows what state he's in. He, uh, sets, he defines variables for the first and last LED. And here he goes through his count, which count is equal to, oh, his count, that's how many times he wants to do it. So, and then there's a duration you have passes in as well. So you see he's gonna do everything inside of here as many times as we tell it to do around there and do it. So he creates a loop from a number of LEDs. So we know there's eight LEDs. So he's gonna loop through this eight times. J is equal to zero. J is less than eight. So if it's greater than seven, basically, it's since we're starting at zero. Remember, the Arduino starts at zero, not oh, not at one. So less than is the right thing because if he was less than or equal, he would be one too many times, and he increments the loop by one every time. So he comes down here, and if it's the first time through, the first LED is equal to zero. Last LED is equal to number of LEDs minus one. So that's going to be uh, seven. Remember, uh, he started at zero. So, and then that means LED zero is on and LED seven is on the first time through. Then he writes the bits out and he sums the array that he's sending out. So there's his LED. I think some array is his routine. It's not a function I'm aware of uh, inside of Arduino. And we skip the delay if the center leads are crossing or if the leads have reached the ends. So if last LED is equal to first LED plus one, basically do nothing, we skip over the delay, else we want to delay for the duration. So it's not last, and it's not, it's not the first, then, um, or the middle, then we don't delay, and then if it is, we do, we do delay. Then he turns off the leads we just turned on, so he sets the ones we just did, first and last LED, to off. He increments first LED and last LED, and does that throughout the whole loop. And then he basically at the end turns everything off after the delay. He cleans himself up. All right, so now we come down to random LEDs. And he clears the array and again turns everything off so he knows where he's at. He uh, defines random number, random num. And uh, again, we're passing in this time a count and duration. So we're going to loop through this loop this for the count. He picks a random uh, he creates a, uh, he generates a random number, and, and that random number is between one, uh, zero and seven. And he goes and he looks and says, "Is it on?" If it's so, then he turns it off and he writes the writes the bits out. And if it's off, then he turns it on. So basically, he's toggling random LEDs on or off depending on their current state. And then he delays and he goes through that loop. However many times we tell him to do that, or he tells us to do that. And then we randomly turn off, we do the reverse basically, any remaining LEDs. So he goes through and he um, 
look, he's basically going through and looking for anything that's greater than zero. So if some LED, some array LED is greater than zero, there's an LED that's turned on. So he's going to continue to do this randomly until he gets them all turned off. That's what he's sitting here doing in this loop. All right, so now we go down to the marquee effect. And again, input, we have duration and count. And we clear the array and turn off all the LEDs so we know where we are. And he's going through the loop for the number of counts that we've said. And he is writing out, he's basically turning on uh, the odd LEDs. And then he's coming down here, he's waiting. And then he's turning on the even LEDs now. Something to remember when this happens is when you write the bits out for the even LEDs, it's going to overwrite what the odd LEDs were. There's no reason to turn them off because what you're sending has them turned off already. And then he does the del you know, delays through each of that. And at the end, turns them all off. Okay, so here we go to Chase. And we clear clears our, the array so we know where things at. And turn, turns off everything off. Here's the duration divided by number of leads. So let's look at this. We're passing in duration, the count, the number of LEDs, and what direction. So it's a true or false as far as direction goes. So he's saying duration is equal to duration by number of LEDs. And uh, trailing LEDs is equal to number of LEDs minus one. And the LED counter is the number of LEDs plus trailing LEDs. Okay, so here we go through the count. And let's see, I don't think I walked through this one earlier. So his LED counter, he's going to go through each LED uh, and turn them on. And if it's reverse, he's going to write the bits in reverse. So um, he basically, what he's doing is he's starting at uh, one end or the other and turning on uh, the lights in order. We are chasing them. This is called chasing. And you can see right here, if it reverse is equal to true, he just outputs them in reverse. And we'll see the right bits down at the bottom a little bit farther. And then he goes to the next LED and turns it on, and he turns off the trailing LEDs uh, behind it. So what's basically happening is the number of LEDs is how many are lit or turned on at one time. So you may have three turned on at a time, and three of them will move across all eight, chasing each other around. But after the third one, they turn back off. So basically, you have like a little... Um, a little bunch of LEDs. It could be one LED, or it could be two, or it could be three. You may have six going across there, which means you'd have two open open, of them, open ones coming across. It's up to you. It depends on what you, you pass in in that case. And then we have the meter effect, um, and he's passing in duration, the number, and is it forward or reverse? Again, it's a, a Boolean, so it's either true or false. Clears everything at the top, like he did then all the other ones, so he knows where he's at. And if the number is greater than the number of uh, LEDs, then you um, return. So it's not valid. He's, he's checking to see if the number is valid or not. And as a safety precaution, then he comes down, he turns on the leads, and he's going through the num. Let's see, is this way passing in? Yeah, he passed in the number. So, okay, so he's coming down and he's going through LED on. And here he's setting forward or reverse based on that, and then the duration. And then he comes back and he turns them back off. And there's all off, so he cleans himself up. And then here's the Knight Rider effect, the back and forth, the kit effect. <laughs> uh, and uh, he basically has a duration, the count, and the number of LEDs. And again, he clears himself up at the very beginning, so he knows what state he's in. His uh, duration, he divides by the number of LEDs. And he, this is very similar to what we do with the, the chase, where he has the trailing LEDs and the LED counter. And he comes down, he goes through his loop. And you see he's doing the exact same thing as before, where he is writing out bits. Now this Okay, no, nope, doesn't need to know that, I guess. Uh, and he's uh, running out bits in uh, one direction, and then he comes down here and he does it in the opposite direction, right here. So that gives the uh, back and forth effect. At the end of the loop number of times, he clears everything out. And then he's coming down to count up, and if he's basically saying the starting and ending number, and he's going to be counting up in the duration for each transition of LEDs, 
in the direction you want to do it on. Do it in. So he's again clearing himself up. If the end number is less than or equal than the starting number, then he's uh, it's not valid. So just return. That's a good way of making sure you're not going to do divide by zeros or any kind of kind of weird math issues that causes the Arduino to to mess up. And then he goes through his loop. Number to display um, is equal to the starting number, and number to display is number to display is less than the ending, less than or equal to the ending number, and it increments it by one each time. So what this is doing right here is it's setting this equal to this number to start out with. So if you start with 10, it'll be equal to the 10 uh, in initialization of the for loop. And then he determines if it's forward or reverse, and he writes the bits in forward or reverse, and he has a delay right here. And then he goes to countdown, and this will be probably on the exact opposite of what he just did. And you can see, uh, Yep, exactly what he's doing. So he's saying number to display at the start number, and the number, while number to display is greater than the ending number, because ending number should be less than, uh, because you're start you're counting down, and then he decrements it by a one every time it goes through the loop. And you see his safety safety right here. So end number should always be uh, less than the start number. So if it's for some reason greater than or equal to the start number, then you just return nothing to do. And here he goes through his loop, same way he did the other one, and which direction do you want it to go, forward or reverse? He's looking right here, the boolean. Okay, so here's his sum array, and you can see he's using a shift. So um, we need to probably talk about shifting a little bit here, a little, and how shifting actually works, because this is how he's doing his, his uh, addition to get the total number. So he basically is going through each of his array elements. So he's passing in his, his array of items that are on or, or off, and uh, he starts it out at zero, and as he goes through each one, if it is on, then he adds to the total the value of that bit, which is one shifted to the left by the current i, which is the loop count. So he's basically getting the number of that bit position. So the first time through, it's going to be equal to one. The second time through, it's going to be equal to two. The third time through, it's going to be equal to four because he's shifting it to the left three bits, which gives him four. So total is equal to total, whatever we added up so far, plus four, which is one shifted to the left by the count of i. And when he's done going through his loop, he comes back with this number, which is between zero and 255, that is ret returned, and that's the number we got to send out. So he's he's actually using an eight, uh, eight element array instead of adding up the numbers by value. There's a couple ways you could have done it. He could have done it like he would have set uh, LED 1 equal to 1, LED 2 equal to 2, LED 3 equal to 4, LED uh, 4 equal to 8, and then he could have added them all up together at, in a sum, and that would have just been another way of doing it. But um, this way works just as well, and, and makes, actually makes a little more sense being in an array, a little bit easier to handle. Okay, here's his all on. So he set this value at the very top. Remember, we looked at all on. This is based on the number of LEDs set at the top. So he basically takes one, the value of one, shifts it to the left by the number of LEDs, and then subtracts one. So he goes back with 255. So all ones equal to 255. He writes his bits out. That turns all of them on. All off does the exact opposite. All off is equal to zero. Zero bits means no LEDs. And here's his clear array. Basically, he's going through his array and setting all the LEDs to off so he knows what state they're in. And we see him do that a lot to make sure he knows. And then here he has uh, write bits. This is forward. So he's writing it MSB first in the value of the number. And then he has uh, write bits reversed, which is least significant bit first in the number. So you know another option here would have been maybe to put the direction in right bits and make the default equal to MSB first. Uh, again, it's just a different way of doing it. There's no, I mean, there's not a right way or a wrong way. This works just fine, and it makes it very easy to understand when you see right bits or right bits reverse, which direction you're going. So either way works just, just great. And then here is the actual routine that's doing the writing out. So everything you see up top here when we're doing the forward and reverse, it's calling out bits in the direction in the number. And down here, he is doing the latch low, he's set, and the data pin and clock pin are already set. The, the direction is being passed in and out bits, and the number value. 
and then he puts the latch pin back high. So he does all this work right here, which is all you need to know one place. Data pin and clock pin is kind of hidden from the other routines. It makes it much simpler to, to follow. And that is it. That's the end of this program. Now, it sounds like a lot, but uh, it really, if you start walking through it, uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, the one of the things that we talked about in here that we haven't talked about before is shifting left to right. And this is a function, basically Arduino is based on the C language and is a function in C. I probably would recommend um, just writing a little program with zero out and just trying it once. Um, you know, do a serial print for a little in brackets, put one uh, less than, less than, I'm sorry, B, yeah, less than, less than, and like try one, then do two, then do three, then do four, and look at the numbers that are coming back and you'll see um, what it's doing. And if you go, if you're on Windows or, or Mac or whatever, go to your calculator and put in the numbers coming back and uh, in decimal, and then click in the binary button. And if you don't Windows, you have to go to Scientific, I think, to get this. Uh, and it'll show you what bits are on or off. And you'll see, if you look at each number, how the bits are moving across, and it'll make a little more sense to you. Again, uh, it's good to go check out the binary instructions uh, in Wikipedia. They have great documentation on Wikipedia about it. So um, if it's okay with Bob, I will uh, put a link to his stuff. It's out there. Uh, it's up, I'm going to let it up to him to what he wants to do how much he wants to give out, how much he wants to divulge. So um, we'll see what he wants to do with that. But uh, you'll definitely get all the show notes. And I want to talk about something else that's coming up uh, as well. Uh, I mentioned we're going to continue on with shift registers. Let me um, go there first for already in this. There's different kinds of shift registers. Um, and in this case, I was using one shift register. And I mentioned before about the zero out. The zero out allows me to tie another shift register to the end of this one. So instead of eight bits, I'd be doing 16 bits. So um, I think this particular set of chips allows me to go up. Now uh, it's four or eight chips in a row. I can't remember exactly. It's a, it's a large number that you can chain together, and it still it understands. Uh, and basically, what it does is serial out. So when you go through shift register, the reason you use the clock, and this is part of the logic. Uh, let me see if I can bring up the logic of this real quick, and maybe show you what I'm talking about. Um, so this is the drawing of the actual inside of the chip, and it, there's latches. So when you go through the clock, each of these latches, latches open or shut depending on the clock. So as it comes down the line, it basically is storing into here what value uh, is it on or off, and it's moving down the line as it does it. Well, when you tie them into zero or out, when you get to the end of the eighth bit, anything you send beyond the eighth bit gets sent out zero or out. So basically, actually it even shows that in this drawing. If you come down to the bottom, yeah, let me show you the bottom. So you see right down here, when I've shifted out of all this, it starts sending the, re the next, th the first thing you sent out, the zero out. So as you're sending data, each bit you get gets, keeps getting pushed down farther and farther. Well, eventually it's getting pushed out the door. Well, when it goes out the door, it goes out zero out, which ties to zero in on yet another um, shift register. So when you do that, after on bit nine, the second shift register gets the first bit you sent out. So it's uh, you can keep sending out 16 bits and go to the next one. Well, it goes the same way down to the next one and the next one. So it basically, it's how many bits you are sending out depending on how many shift registers you have. So we're going to look at doing more with shift registers next week. Um, the other thing that there's different kinds of shift registers. They don't always call them that, but it's basically what they are. An LED driver for like a, new, a number is basically a shift register and you send it the same kind of value. And in fact, you could use this chip to control uh, a seven or eight segment LED, like a little number, and it would work just fine. Um, and there's chips that are designed just to do that. And sometimes they call them matrices. And what, they, what they're designed to do is they have a little bit additional logic in it. So in the event of you have a seven segment LED, you would typically have, if you think about it, if you had four of those, you would have 28 pins you have to, to, to work with. Well, there's ways around that. Uh, you basically go through in order the first, second, third, and fourth. You turn one on uh, really fast. You, you turn it off and go to the next one. You do it so fast that your eye thinks it's on, but really it's cycling between them really fast. So these chips that drive these can do that. They remember what number you want to put out. It's basically like having uh, four shift registers inside of one or one shift register with the memory. And as it goes through, it cycles. So it turns on, uh, basically, uh, in most cases, it turns the positive on 
and uh, to the LED, the segment segment LED, and then whatever the shift register has as a drain turned on lights up, and then it stops that voltage and changes the shift register and turns the voltage on to the next LED number digit, and it does that so fast that your eye thinks it's turned on all the time, and it's not. And these chips are designed to do this uh, very quickly, and it, they call them LED drivers, but they are effectively a shift register uh, with a little bit of a logic in them. So I have some of those here. Uh, I still haven't gotten the LED segments, so I have to wait for that to come in yet. And I've also ordered, uh, they call it a matrix, and it's basically designed to do a very similar thing to that, but it's designed to work with the LED matrix. I showed you some I got uh, last week, week before. There's a bunch of LEDs, it's an eight by eight uh, segment, and they're designed to do the same thing with that, and they cycle through as well. They also cycle the LEDs really fast, so they don't gotta use so many pins. And uh, I have some of those on the way as well, and we're gonna talk about those. And in addition to that, there's something that is like a shift register, but it uses pulse width modulation. I've never used one before, but I have some on the way, and that'd be a, a fun thing to actually learn. And uh, it works on a very similar uh, concept of the shift, shift register. You basically are sending out a value, it interprets the pulse width modulation value, and outputs the pins just like the shift register does. So that's coming as well. All right, so that is it for shift registers for this week. I do want to talk about something that's coming up. Um, we are putting out another show. It will not be a live show. It will be like a, a batch. We call it, we call it batching, um, like our Security 101 or our Mac Minutes are, where we will do, you know, we will record, you know, 12 weeks at a time. Basically, we will sit in a room and record 12 weeks at a time. Probably this, in this case, it will be 12 weeks at a time because it's a lot longer format of a show. But um, it will not be live, like interactive, like this one is. And it's called The Program, and it's around programming, learning programming languages. And we're going to start out the first couple weeks about generally how computers work, um, a little bit how memory works, uh, how programmers ac access memory, the basics of programming, because basically if you look at the, under the covers, all programming languages work effectively the same, because the computer works exactly the same no matter what language you're using, and you're just manipulating the computer using a different language. So we're gonna cover the basics of the, the computer programming, um, I have a belief that if you know one language, you can learn another one real easy because it's typically the only difference is, for the most part, uh, formatting and uh, punctuation, things like that. There are some things that are different. Um, C handles you know, how it passes data from function to function more closely to what it really is like in, in, the, in the computer versus, versus Visual Basic or something like that. It hides all that from you. But in general, the concept is the same. So we want to cover the basics first. I think we're going to go to Python first, and it'll probably be like, I'm guessing 12 weeks per language. We're going to try to go through uh, well, Python, maybe PHP, uh, maybe, maybe Visual Basic and C Sharp. Uh, they're very similar. I mean, we'll maybe try to combine them into one one series because they're not similar enough. Um, some Perl probably, uh, maybe some shell scripting. I'm trying to think, there's other languages that we uh, we use quite a bit, uh, and we're also probably going to eventually delve into JavaScript in libraries like Sencha. Um, we use a lot of Sencha, so we know Sencha very well, um, or jQuery, something like that. We, we use some jQuery, but we pretty much moved everything to Sencha now. And uh, so we're going to start covering that. So we, we have not planned out for if we do 12 weeks per language. We have quite a long time uh, of stuff you know planned out, but that's coming up. And we the thing we don't do in this show as much is, is dig into the language, and uh, we don't want to... Uh, go that direction with this show. We'd rather stick it into somebody that's interesting in just programming, not the electronics. People are like interested in electronics and you can go back and forth between whatever you want. Um, I imagine we'll probably cover C fairly early on as well. Um, maybe even before Python because we use that language so much in the Arduinos. And uh, we may even go into, like I said, we said about some shell scripting. Um, the reason we're also looking at Python is the Raspberry Pis are very big on Python. So um, th we're doing some Raspberry Pi projects. So it all ties together. It's a new show. It's still in its infancy, though. We don't even have the graphics done yet. So we are uh, we know what we want to do. We're just working on all the administrative side of it now. So it's probably still a couple weeks away, but it's coming. So uh, keep your eyes out for that. All right, that is it for Let's Make It for this week. I uh, hope you enjoyed this, and uh, we'll be doing more of the shift registers next week or so. Uh, and then uh, I'm not sure where we're going to that. So we'll have to keep tuning in to find out. And again, thank you to Bob Powell uh, 
for all of his help in the code and the suggestions for this. If you have suggestions for things you'd like to see or you have code you'd like to share, anything like that, please let us know. We're very happy uh, to uh, include that and, uh, and bring it up on our shows. We love, love the input from um, our viewers, uh, actually very much. And we're getting a lot of emails here recently, and we, I love it. Uh, a little slow getting back, I'm a little busy, but uh, I, can do, I do get back to you. It just takes me a little bit of time. And uh, one other thing I'm probably going to cover uh, next week is um, we did the Zigbee um, well, was like three weeks ago now. We talked about the wireless. We had a viewer. It's just another wireless chip. I just got them uh, yesterday, and I'm going to try that. And it's a lot lower cost than Zigbee. It's not as robust, but uh, for some things you're doing, it may work just fine. So we, um, we're going to try to maybe go back and do a little quick review on that. And I'll even bring out the um, the servos and see how well it works. So that's coming up in a future episode. It'll be a little side episode there somewhere as well. Um, this week's sponsor, again, is Ting. Um, if you haven't ever used Ting or looked at Ting, I recommend you do it. And if you're on Sprint, you need to go there quick because uh, Ting is much less expensive than Sprint, and it's on the Sprint network. So if you know Sprint works good for you, you can start saving some money for you and your family. Uh, it is our sponsor this week. Um, there will be a... A $25, yeah, $25 discount on your first bill or any phone that you buy. And it's you get to that by going to tech-zen.tv slash ting. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, we'll see you next week. For show notes for this show, contacts, and more, go to the techzen.tv website where you can get show notes for all of our shows. We love to hear from our viewers and listeners. We have an email, a Twitter, and a phone number where you can contact us for each show. For details, visit the techzen.tv website and get the show details. You can also make a video and upload it somewhere like YouTube or Vimeo and then just send us a link. You never know, you may see your video in a future show. You can get all of our shows delivered automatically to your favorite device by going to your favorite podcast website like iTunes and subscribing. Each of our shows also has a YouTube channel you can subscribe to to get regular updates. Our shows are also available on most internet radio networks like Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. You can also watch and listen to our shows on Xbox, TiVo, and Roku. You can even find us on your Zoom.